It seemed like a good idea at the time. Being retired, I had time on my hands, so I needed a project to occupy myself, and restoring an old car seemed natural. I found what appeared to be a suitable candidate up in Wisconsin. It was in good shape, but had a few small problems. The rubber chassis and suspension bushings were undoubtedly rotten and needed replacing with new poly bushings. It probably needed a new exhaust system and most likely new brake pads. How hard could this be? Two years later, I understood why every book that's ever been written on the subject of restoring an old car begins with exactly the same sentence. If I knew what I was getting into, I never would have begun. Well, let's see if we can start to get this left wheel apart. Ah, oh, is it dirty under here? This thing must have been sitting out in a bog for the last five years. Well, we got the parts back from the powder coater today. They are looking beautiful. And now, we have to try to figure out which bushing goes with which part. And then we can begin to reassemble the, uh, the front suspension. We're about five weeks into this and we're finally at the point where we can begin to put something back together. So far all we've done is take things apart. So this looks like it. Control arm upper inside bushings. Australian made. Okay, well, we'll see what we can do. Well, we got a bunch of parts back from the powder coater yesterday. So now we can put the, uh, the new bushings in, get them ready to reinstall back in the, back in the car. Put a little bit of this goo on the inside, make it easy. Spread some on the outside of the bushing. Take it over here to the vise. Slide straight in nice and neat. I like these better than the <coughs> cotton reel bushings because you don't have to fumble with the trying to squeeze the fat end in. Although the, we'll have to do that with the bushing that goes in the bottom of the king pin. These are uh, Super Pro bushings from Australia. And they're kind of interesting in that they have little grooves on the inside of the bushing that will hold this bearing grease, silicone grease, inside to uh, keep it lubricated. Whether that was a failing on the metal elastic bushings that we took out, I don't know. The metal elastics were 40 some odd years old, so they will be on their useful life, I'm sure. This is the crush tube that goes into the bushing. It's in here that the bolt will ride. Same thing. Slide it in with the vise, make it easy. And then, when we're ready, this is the upper fulcrum for the suspension. And 
and we'll just slide these on. I'm going to cheat and put them together in advance, tighten them up and put the cotter pins in, and then we can hang them in the wheel well. The reason I want to cheat is because these things sit inside of a little depression. And it's darned hard to get a torque wrench on them when they're inside the depression. So we're making progress. We're starting to put things back together after months of taking them apart. Well, it took a bit of beating on with a three pound mallet to get the upper wishbone to uh, seat. But I think we got this thing all installed now. We've got the bolts in place. It seems to be correct. We'll see as we begin to fit the wheel hub brakes and so forth back on. Okay, well, here's today's challenge. It's trying to replace the tie rod end at the on the steering uh, rack so I could uh, rig up the left side suspension but the tie rod end is absolutely welded with rust to the end of the uh, steering rack. I was sort of taken in by the fact that over on the right side of the car when I did that one it came apart fairly easily and I was able to put the new tie rod end onto the uh, rack without really much trouble. But for some reason the left side of this car is infinitely more corroded than the right side of the car which was in itself bad enough. So it looks like I'm gonna have to take out the uh, steering rack and replace it. Fortunately Victoria British was having a sale and I picked up a uh, steering rack for no other reason than it was half price and I figured on an old car like this it wouldn't uh, hurt to have one around. So here we are. Looks like we're going to use it after all. So maybe once in a while you do get lucky, I don't know. If you can call it that luck. Well, the box has arrived from Victoria British this morning. Should have inside it our new brake rotors, discs, hoses, so we can finish this uh, front suspension project. And let's see what we have in the bag here. have some pads we have some stainless steel brake hoses and we have new rotors Take a look at these bad boys. Five bolt pattern, notched and cross drilled. Not quite as heavy as the uh, EBC pads that we sent, or rotors we sent back because they weren't ventilated. But looks like a definite upgrade for the MGCs front brakes. Well, there's the axle out, sitting on that axle stand made out of an old engine stand. 
let it sit there for a minute, make sure it doesn't collapse, and then we've done this little part of the test. After that, we'll get it cleaned off and get some paint on it. All right, we've got the rear end up on a uh, axle stand. And now before it starts raining today, and before the homeowners association can complain, we're going to try taking the power washer to it and see if we can't get off some of the accumulated mud and grease. Okay, well, step one is complete. I've got it off the uh, axle stand and has lowered it down onto a pair of jack stands. Next thing I need to find is something to support that nose while I uh, move the crane out of the way. And then we'll see if we can find a balance point on the floor jack so we can move the axle under the car. And then with any luck, we'll raise it back up, put the jack stands back under the uh, axle That'll hold it at the right elevation while we get the rebound straps on and then begin to attach the leaf springs. Well, here's something interesting today. I was trying to put the new poly bushings into the leaf springs and they don't fit. If I take the dimension here of the inside diameter at the barrel of the bushing it's about uh, 1.4 if I go over here and take the inner diameter of the big eye on the leaf spring it's about 1.18 1, 1, eh, 1 so we got a blivet here there's no way you're going to get this bushing into that hole and then I happen to notice something there's a metal sleeve in there which I assumed it was where the bushing goes but after doing a Google search, or well, first of all, I remembered that the bushing that came out of here was called a metal elastic bushing. So I did a Google search and found out that yes, the old bushing had a metal sleeve around it, and the metal sleeve is rusted there into the barrel. So now we're going to have to press that out somehow with the uh, hydraulic press in order to get these new bushings in. So there's a little surprise that happens when you're doing something for the first time and it's the first time you've ever done it. So let's see if we can get this thing out. Well there it is. All it took was a lot of grease, patience, banging on it with uh, the hammer, squeezing it in the vise. But we got the first bushing in. So now it's on to number two. Well there it is. The rear axle is back in place, springs are on, Hubs are in place, shock absorbers attached, everything looks great. Except, if you take a close look at that dust cover for the wheel, it's on backwards. So that means I now have to undo all of my good work of the last few days. Take this stuff apart, turn them around, and reinstall them. I just hate when that happens. Well, now it's time to deal with the snake pit. These are the loose wires that come out of the box, the others all being uh, woven together into a harness for the front of the car. But there are a number of wires for things like the turn signals and who knows what all. They have to be fished out individually, and so now we try to separate this mass and uh, into individual identifiable bundles so you can run those to their respective positions. As I say, I don't know what it is with wires. 
you start very neatly to try to pull one out of a pile and the next thing you know if you got this okay well if you like puzzles this certainly was one I've now managed to break down that rat's nest of wires into discrete bundles that I can identify and now comes the job of uh, deciding which ones go where use the wiring diagram I've got a uh, installation guide and we'll start laying these wires out to their respective positions and see if we can optimize the layout so as to avoid tangles and crosses and all the other problems that wires are heir to. Well, this is my solution to a long-running problem. The electrical panel in the MG, the original, is only about a two-inch square and it has no circuit protection on it. So, uh, typically with an old English car, the way you find out you have a short circuit is when the car burns to the ground. So, since I'm trying to improve this car where systems have improved over the years. I thought I would mount a larger circuit breaker panel or correction fuse panel with relays to take the load off the switches in the car. Problem was the panel is fairly large relative to the original. So I decided to try and mount it up underneath the uh, dashboard in the car. So to that end, I took a piece of uh, poplar wood and I cut out a couple of uh, pieces and mounted them up under the dashboard so I have something to screw into. For aesthetic purposes, I decided I would uh, cover them in black vinyl. And I made this little flap. The hinge is already mounted up in the car, but the idea was um, I could mount the panel on the flap and then tuck the flap up underneath the dashboard. There are a couple of nifty latches. They're uh, Zeus fasteners of all things. They're a little different from what I normally think of with a Zeus. But they uh, I think they'll do the job pretty well. They latch up and down like that. And there is a uh, this little post will attach to the other side of the flap so that when you uh, close the, uh, the latch and it fastens onto these and uh, with any luck will stay in place. The original of this I made with a piece of three-quarter ply but then when it came time to mount the aft brake booster we found out that uh, the bottom of the bolts and the nuts fouled the flap, so I remade it with a piece of quarter inch ply. And uh, I'm going to try and see if we can get that uh, panel tucked up underneath so we can start to rewire the car, which is the next main event for uh, this particular project. So, anyway, that's where we sit with this uh, idea. Let me see if I can get this flap uh, screwed in underneath the dash and then I'll show you how my finished product came out. Okay, well here's the flap in place. It seems to work okay. So now all that remains is for me to get my fat body down into that wheel well and attach the pegs up to the forward piece secure it in place and then we can put the fuse panel on and with any luck start to run the wires over for the instrument panel and out into the engine bay for the lights and starter and all of the other accoutrements. Okay well we get the pegs in and now we're installing the new electrical panel. As you can see it's a fairly comprehensive system a lot more uh, circuit protection than the old one allowed. So with any luck get that screwed in and get the wires strung and we can begin to rewire this car. Okay well it's time to start stringing wires I guess. Now that we have the uh, 
fuse panel in place underneath the dashboard. Start running some wires out to uh, the various locations on the car. The point of the exercise right now is just simply to try and see uh, the best way to route the lines. Try to avoid uh, tangling the wires. And I don't know what it is with wires, but two wires get anywhere near one another and they just wad themselves up into a ball like a pit full of snakes. Anyway, there's uh, wires for the headlights. I got some new headlight buckets coming by the end of the week. Uh, these wires are the headlights running over to the uh, other side plus the horn wire. Uh, these are for the proposed driving lights. The yellow wires in uh, the auto advanced auto wire harness uh, substitute for the traditional brown wire in the uh, British uh, wiring scheme. They, uh, they're for the uh, power lines coming off of the uh, starter and uh, starter relay uh, where it connects. So with the main feed coming from the battery which is in the back under the uh, seats. If those taillights seem a lot brighter to you, it's because they are. In addition to upgrading the electrical system and the wiring, I also replaced all of the incandescent bulbs in the car with LEDs. They're brighter and they use less power. Okay, we finally got the radio installed in the car. And I guess we'll give it a try. Got the wires running around, some speakers in the trunk, got the amplifier hooked up. So let's see if this thing works. So it looks like we have radio. So, I guess we can say it's successful. Well, yesterday we took the two brake boosters off and sent them up to White Post in uh, Virginia to be rebuilt. Had to cut the vacuum hoses off to be able to remove the vacuum booster. Now, it's trying to get the clip off that holds the hose in place so we can replace the uh, hoses which should be arriving sometime tomorrow at least if the UPS tracking information is at all valid. Well it's time to start looking at the meat of this uh, particular project. I have the intakes, carburetors, exhaust manifold off. Boy, let me tell you those are some beefy parts exhaust manifold is cast iron. Together the intakes and the exhaust weigh about 35 pounds. It was like picking up an old steam radiator from a Boston tenement. I'm trying to label the parts so when the time comes to put the engine back together again I can remember what things are. In my dreams what I would like to do is replace those two SU carburetors with uh, three Webers. Well, there we have the engine out. And there's the engine. As you can see, it is bloody filthy.
All right, next step is to get it cleaned apart, cleaned up, get it apart, get it down to the machine shop. At the machine shop, I had them bore the block out 20 over, new pistons, rings, rods, bearing shells, and I sent the camshaft up to Daytona Beach to crane cams to be reground into a fast road profile. Well, we're coming up on a big day here. We're getting ready to uh, put the engine back in. It's back from the machine shop. It's all tarted up. It's got some nice paint on it. As you can see, we made a few changes. Put in a spin-on oil filter and uh, upgraded the alternator from the 65 amp stock one to uh, 110 GM style amp since we're using um, halogen headlights and driving lights and probably put in a better radio and so forth so uh, need more power well as long as we had the engine out of the car I replaced the 20 kilo cast iron flywheel with a lightweight 12 pound steel flywheel I got from Kirk's Auto Refitters up in Iowa and since we have a new flywheel, we also replaced the entire clutch assembly. For increased performance, we're going to run triple Weber carburetors on individual runner manifolds. The Webers are 48 DCOE that we sourced from Pierce Manifolds in California. The exhaust system is a header exhaust system from Manaflow in the UK. The two individual headers connect to one of Manaflow's twin pipe four box free flow exhaust systems. Okay, here we are, 3MA, 2016, 16 months after we started this. Time to try to start the engine. Water is on for coolant, power is on, batteries are all hooked up. Let's see what happens. As any home builder will tell you, it doesn't matter what the quality of the materials buried inside the walls are like, people judge you on what they can see. And what they can see is the quality of the trim work. When I began this project, I really didn't intend to do any work on the interior except maybe treat myself to a wood-rimmed steering wheel. The carpets were okay, so was the leather upholstery on the seats. The top was in fair shape, although it did have a big split in the rear window that someone had tried to fix by putting packing tape over it. But other than that, things seemed to be good enough. My first purchase was a custom-made wood-rimmed steering wheel from Motolita in the UK. It's asymmetric with the lower spoke shortened to give an extra inch of thigh room for us American wide bodies. As anyone who has ever undertaken any kind of a restoration project will tell you, very quickly the renovations take on a life of their own. The interior panels I originally thought were good enough looked shabby and dated once they were out of the car, and the carpeting really needed to be replaced. I thought about waiting until the annual Moss Motors interior sale, but then decided that if I had my druthers, what I really wanted was a tan interior with black piping. So I shipped the seat frames off to Heritage Upholstery in Palm Springs, California to be recovered in tan leather and also have them make new interior panels. The plan for the new radio was to install the speakers on the aft bulkhead between the passenger compartment and the trunk. 
but I didn't want to cut any holes in the structure of the car. So I made a panel out of quarter-inch plywood and installed the mid-range speakers in Retropods. For the tweeters, I made similar panels for the front of the car. And since the 1969 model of the MGC doesn't have a glove compartment, I added a pocket for storing papers like registration and owner's manuals. For the floor covering, I imported a Wilton wool carpet set from the UK. Then I found a carpenter up in Connecticut who made burlwood caps for the tops of the doors. And I figured as long as I was being extravagant, I might as well extend the carpet into the car's boot as well. And lastly, even though I know people in Florida rarely drive their convertible with the top up, I opted to replace the weather-beaten vinyl top with a brand new German canvas one. Someone once told me that projects like this never get finished. They only get abandoned. And so it was, two years after driving the MG into the garage for some simple repairs, I drove it out on its first test drive. And a few weeks after that, I displayed it at our local antique auto show. Well, here we are at the arrival hall. These are cars are all pre-registered for the event. Let's see, we have a Jensen, behind that a Chrysler Crossfire, pulling in behind that is a hot rod, and let's see, it's one of those um, Chrysler Panteras, I forget what they call them. I made it to this year's car show. So here's my car after two years of uh, hard work for its first display. When I arrived at the show, I hadn't planned on entering any kind of a competition, but I was prevailed upon to fill out a form and have my car judged. And although there was some formidable competition, I actually won a prize. So that's the story of my two-year restoration project of an old MG. And while I wouldn't trade those memories for a million bucks, you couldn't pay me enough to do it again. <laughs>